uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, uh, in some sense, the end of a story, right? Like it brings the promises of the Old Testament to fulfillment. Because Jesus, having exhausted the demands of the law, and having exhausted the demands of God's justice, has now been publicly vindicated, declared by God to be God's Son in power and authority because of His return from the grave. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus is the declaration that Jesus is who He said that He was. And it's God's way of saying, hey, it's verified. The, the, the check went through. Counts. Jesus really was who He said He was. The end. And in some sense, it, it's the culmination of everything that was happening. And in another sense, the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of something new. In fact, it's the beginning of everything new in God's work of redemption. The resurrection of Christ marks the inauguration or the launching of God's new cosmos, the first fruits of a coming harvest of resurrection reality that is going to someday impact the entire creation. And we just got started. It's the opening chapter of eternal life, the second Jesus rises up from the grave. Every supernatural, every divine, every heavenly benefit for the church from here to eternity future is nothing other than the outworking of the victory of Jesus and his triumph over sin and death by rising from the grave. The spiritual life of the Christian, check this out, the spiritual life of the Christian is nothing other than the resurrection life of Jesus breaking into your world. Everything you are as a Christian was purchased by the merits of the obedience of Jesus unto death that we celebrated last Friday. It was all purchased there. That's where the cost was paid. That's where the obedience, that's where the merit lies for the purchase of everything that you now experience by virtue of the fact that you are connected to the Jesus who rose from the dead. Every heavenly benefit comes from the fact that you are united to the resurrected Christ. Not to a Christ in the grave. A Christ who passed through the grave. And so the resurrection is right at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's right at the heart of Christian living now. We live the resurrection life. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And today, as we'll see, the resurrection, therefore, has serious implications for how we are called to live the rest of our life here on earth. So we're going to go to John's Gospel. If you're not there already, please open up to chapter 20. And we're going to consider the implications of the resurrection for everyday life. And here's what I want to do. I want to spend quite a bit of the time this morning just telling the story. I'm just going to walk through the account and, and listen in because... Um, it always starts with the story. It always starts with the uh, account of here's what God did. We're going to talk about some of like what's the implication for your life, but we're, we're going to start with let me just tell you what happened. And all things in the work of the kingdom start with that declaration. Not of what you are called to do, but with what God has already done. The context of our passage in John 20 is, is that Jesus was uh, crucified Friday, uh, Good Friday. He was bound in linen after he had died, uh, and he was wrapped up in cloths together with spices. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were both uh, in all likelihood members of the Sanhedrin, the high Jewish council of the time, were the ones who, uh, well, previous to the death of Jesus, uh, 
they had been uh, hesitant to identify themselves publicly with him, even though they kind of had an inclination toward him. But once he's, once he's crucified, they kind of come out of the woodwork, and they're the ones who actually bury Jesus. Uh, Joseph asks Pilate for the body. Nicodemus brings the spices. They wrap him up in the linen cloths, and they bury him in a tomb in a garden that was near to Golgotha. Uh, they had to get the body somewhere fairly quickly because the sun was going down. As soon as the sun goes down, the Sabbath begins. And they, can't be, they can't be defiling themselves on the Sabbath by handling a dead body. And so they quickly bury Jesus. And then John skips over the events of Saturday. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also don't really have anything to say about what happened yesterday on uh, what we would call Holy Saturday. Um, John picks up the story very early Sunday morning. Read with me John chapter 20, the first couple verses. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So, so the very first day of the week, which means Sunday, very early in the morning, while it's still dark. Who was up this morning while it was dark? Just me and Justin probably shocked. Okay. Um, well, Mary is up quite early. She goes to the tomb. And uh, other accounts seem to indicate that there were some other women with her as well. And what do you think her understanding of the situation is as she's going to the tomb? Well, it's precisely whatever her understanding of the situation was Friday when she saw the massacre of the Lord Jesus Christ. So she's, she's disappointed. Uh, she's, she's horrified. She's broken. She's confused. Uh, the darkness of the morning is a good picture of the heart of Mary as she goes to the tomb of Jesus. So when she gets there, she finds that it's been uncovered. The stone that covered the entryway to the tomb has been moved. And she draws the conclusion that it's been empty. Probably not because she looked inside necessarily, because it's still dark. There's nothing really to see she just presumes the stone's been moved, there's been a grave robbery, which was not actually all that uncommon in the day. And so she panics, and she runs, and this is not a faith-filled report of the resurrection. She runs to Peter and to John, and she's like, somebody ripped off the body. She's totally freaking out. And I don't know where he's at. Well, then Peter and John take off. They run to the tomb. Check it out, verse 3 and following. So... Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. The, the, the beloved disciple, which is John's strange way of referring to himself throughout the book of the Gospel of John, uh, the beloved disciple, or the, 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 the disciple that Jesus loved, is, um, according to church history, younger than Peter. And faster. He's been training with a guy like Jacques. And so, uh, so they, they, they hear that the, that the body's gone. They take off. They run together for a little bit. And then John's just, John's just faster. He gets there first. And... Uh, he stoops down to peek inside the tomb. Now, the, now the tomb <coughs> entryway was not uh, very large, 24 to 36 inches, uh, what I remember being 42 inches. Uh,
but it, it, it was it was in the side, like dug into the side of a hill, like almost like a cave dug into the to the side of a hill, hewn out of rock. And so he's got to stoop down to look inside. And when he does, he sees the burial cloths, those same fragrant linens that had been anointed with spices when they wrapped the body up just a few days before. He sees them all uh, laying in the tomb, which means that Jesus' body was not simply moved by some grave robber. It was unbound. If you were going to rob a grave, why would you take the time to unbound the body, which would only have helped the transportation of the body? So some, something's going on here. John probably in all likelihood recognizes, like, this is weird. Why are the, why are the cloths there? Doesn't make sense. Well, Peter gets there, and he investigates further. In a very Peter-like way, he just goes into the tomb. Now, that's kind of creepy. Like, imagine this. Like, oh my gosh, somebody's robbed the grave. Well, I'm going to go in and make sure. Uh, so he goes inside the tomb. Peter's not afraid. Uh, and he not only sees the burial cloths, but he sees the face cloth, or, or what we would think of as kind of like a handkerchief. Um, nicely folded up or rolled up, perhaps, and set aside. It had been wrapped around Jesus' head, but now it's been removed, carefully laid aside, intentionally handled, perhaps you might even say staged, uh, perhaps purposefully drawing attention as though trying to display or communicate something to those who might go into the tomb and take a look at what has happened. Uh, this is not a grave robbery. You don't unwrap the body and then fold up the napkin and set the stage for whoever's going to come in and see. And the boldness of Peter to enter into the tomb inspires John to now take a closer look as well. John goes into the tomb after Peter goes into the tomb, and he sees the same thing. He sees the grave clothes. He sees the face cloth nearly set, neatly set aside. And um, verse 8 says, he saw and believed. Peter saw this scene. And he believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't, we don't know how, how strong was that faith. Was it just kind of a suspicion? What, what's what we, don't, we don't really know. But, but John's own account, his autobiographical account, is that he went in, he saw the clothing and the face cloth, and he had faith in the resurrection of Jesus. And at this point, it's very experience-based because... John tells us at this point he had not yet understood the scriptures, verse 9, as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. John, in other words, John believes in the resurrection because he saw the burial cloths and the face cloth neatly set aside, not because he has understood the Old Testament scriptures at this point. Scriptures like Psalm 16 or Hosea 6, places where there's an indication that there's going to be a resurrection sometime in the future. John doesn't get it. He just saw this scene and something in it communicated something to him that was unmistakable, something that allowed him to understand exactly what had happened. And we don't know exactly what that was, but I have a guess. I have a guess at what allowed John to be triggered with faith when he saw the cloths and the, the face handkerchief laying there. I'm just going to read to you a passage that John wrote down, a memory that John has that he recorded in his gospel. And I think this is what he thought of when he saw this scene. Jesus cried out with a loud voice in John 11:43. Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Un unbind him and let him go. And I think that John has witnessed something like this before. And when he sees a grave, with the body of Jesus missing, 
He remembers before he had seen a dead man brought back from life, stripped from the bondage of his burial clothes, and he sees now this grave filled with burial clothes and a face cloth, and I think John knows exactly what happened. I've seen this before. I've seen this before. And he believed. I think that's what happened. I don't know. I can't prove that. It's speculation. But, oh, man, that's such a cool connection. John's familiar with this resurrection concept even though he doesn't understand the scriptures. Well, of course, the faith of John and the other disciples is not going to have to rely on vague signs in the tomb of a man whose body is missing. But for now, that's all they get. And they return from the tomb to their homes. John, at least, is believing. Peter, probably not. We know from Luke 24 that Peter is just bewildered by the situation. There's no indication that Peter has any sort of faith in what's happened at this point. Mary Magdalene, for sure, is still under the impression that the body was stolen. Read with me, starting in verse 11. Disciples went home, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. I'll, I'll, have, him, I'll have him buried somewhere else. Jesus said to her, Mary. That's all he said. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, <laughs> Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then he had said these things to her. All right, so after Peter and John leave and go back home, uh, at some point, Mary shows back up at the tomb. Because remember, she found the tomb, she went and got them, they ran, and now she's back at the scene somehow. Outside weeping, they've gone home. She's outside the tomb, she's weeping. And this time, she now peeks into the tomb as well. And when she looks in, she sees something different than what Peter and John saw. She sees angelic visitors who begin a conversation with her, and they ask her this simple question, why are you weeping? Which isn't really probably for the sake of gaining information from her. It's almost, you might almost think of it as, as like, hey, there's, it's like a statement, like there's no need to cry. Why are you weeping? There's no need to cry. And Mary shares the same information that she shared with Peter and John when she made the report in the first place. Uh, somebody's taken away the Lord, I don't know where he's at, she still thinks it's a grave robbery. And then she becomes aware of another presence in the garden. And she turns around, and Jesus is standing there. And she doesn't realize that it's him. Uh, for whatever reason, Jesus kind of, post-resurrection, uh, has this ability to like keep people blinded to him. And, uh, and she's been crying, and we don't know all the details, but she thinks it's the gardener, because remember, he's buried in a tomb in a garden. And he asks the same question. Or at least a very similar question. Uh, why are you crying? And whom are you seeking? And she just assumes that he's the robber. Or at least might be. Well, if you've, if you've taken the body, just tell me where he's at. And I'll have, it take, I'll, I'll have him buried somewhere else. I'll take care of it. And then he says one word to her. He just calls her by name. And, I, and I, when I read that, I'm thinking back to the Good Shepherd passage in John 10, 
where Jesus said, the shepherd of the sheep, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. And all he does is just says her name, and all darkness of heart is swallowed up in an instant for her teacher, she cries, and she grabs hold of him, apparently, and like won't let go of him. <laughs> It was, like a, it was like one of those awkward hugs. <laughs> and she's just like, she won't let go. He's like, you don't have to, hey, look, you don't have to cling to me. Like, she, she, she's afraid he's going to leave. Like, he's back. He's not, and I'm not going nowhere, and he's not going nowhere. <laughs> he's like, you don't have to cling to me. I'm not ascending to my father right away. But I'm, but I'm going to. And you need to go talk to my brothers. And he doesn't mean his physical brothers. He means the disciples. And you tell them, my brothers, you tell my brothers, that I am ascending to my father and their father. I'm ascending to my God and their God. In other words, she has a report now. To, she has a message. She has a job to do. She needs to go deliver this message. And entailed in that message is the fact that Jesus has made these guys members of the family of God. It's, a, it's an absolute privilege that this woman takes forward. And by the way... Women were, were the, the testimony of a woman was not even permissible in court to bring about a conviction. And yet this is the, she's the first one given the assignment to testify that the work of Christ on the cross has secured our membership in the family of God. So Jesus, uh, if, if the gospel writers had been fabricating <coughs> A story, they would not have had a woman be the first testimony. They would have had a Roman official, somebody with some clout, not somebody whose testimony is not even permissible in court, which just gives support to the fact that John's just telling us what happened. And so off she goes. She gets after it. I mean, wouldn't you? I'd be sprinting till I puked. And she, she's she got to get word back to the disciples. So she takes off. She finds them. In verse 18, it says she announces that she saw the Lord and that they are in the family. She passes the message along. And how they responded to her message, John doesn't say. But in all likelihood, it was kind of like, what are you, what are you talking about? I think some of the other gospel writers are kind of like indicate they're, they're not really all that um, convinced. What it does tell us, what John does tell us, is that later that same day, most of the disciples got to see and hear from Jesus themselves. Take a look at verse 19. This is the last scene that we're going to look at today. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, Sunday night, tonight, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they had seen the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The disciples are afraid. Their rabbi has just been publicly shamed, scourged, murdered. And these guys are in trouble. And they're hiding. You probably have, uh, well, we know Judas is not with them, of course. Uh, we find out later 
in the same chapter. Thomas is not with them at this point. And so you probably have the remaining ten uh, disciples. And suddenly, in this locked room, Jesus miraculously appears, and he speaks to their fear. And he says, peace be with you. In fact, he says it twice just to make the point. I want you to have peace, guys. There's no need for you to fear anything. And then he proceeds to demonstrate that he is physically resurrected. Uh, this is not a ghost. It's not a vision. It's not a hallucination. Verse 20 says, he showed them his hands and his side. The hands that had received the nails, the side that had been plunged with the spear, Jesus makes sure that they have the opportunity to examine him physically so that it's clear to them that this present Jesus is the same person and this body is the same body that had been crucified on Friday, and that's why it's not in the grave this morning. Right? It's the same body. Now in its glorified state. For some reason, he's not bleeding out. I don't know. Can't wait to try it. On the other side of the grave. And now at last, the words of last Thursday night ring true for these guys. Because if you remember, Thursday night was the night of the feet washing, the betrayal of Judas, the Last Supper, uh, all of John 14, 15, 16, 17, the upper room discourse, that long conversation where Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to be leaving and they are not happy about it. Remember, Peter objects. Everybody's freaking out. And Jesus says to them in John 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, baby she no longer remembers the anguish for joy. That a human being has been born into the world, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again Sunday night, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. It's fulfilled in this moment for these guys. He's standing before them, revealing his victory over sin, over death, over Satan, over the grave. The fear, the sorrow, the despair, the hopelessness, boom, is gone in this moment. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, verse 20 says. It's gone. Forever gone. They saw the resurrected Jesus and it changed them forever. It gave them a gladness of heart, a, heart a, 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 joy, a joy that could not be destroyed. It drove these guys from that day forward. And it's good. They needed that because they had a job to do now. They have a job to do. And here's where I want to park for the rest of our time today. I want to settle into these last three verses as we come to the end of the passage. And I want you to hear these as the, the resurrected Jesus is standing right here today among us this morning, speaking these things to us as though we are in that locked room with him. I want you to imagine yourself being there. In fact, you, don't, you can imagine yourself being there, but it's probably even more accurate to, to realize that Jesus is actually, the resurrected Jesus is actually here today, speaking to us today through the word of God by the power of the Spirit. These, these words are God's words to you and I. The resurrection of Jesus has implications for these men, but it also has implications for us. Things that are meant to flow out of what he has accomplished. And so we have here in these three verses a distilled explanation of the way forward, not only for them, but for us. And let's just start with verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As we settle into these three verses, I want to start with, uh, well, Jesus wants to start with, peace be with you. 
Jesus rises from the grave, and his first words to his disciples are not, get to work. His first words are, I have peace for you. Peace. The, 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 this, is, this is the state of reality that Jesus has brought us into through his death and resurrection. We're recipients of peace. Jesus has made peace for us, between us and God. So whatever fears, whatever sorrows, whatever failures, whatever hopelessness may cloud our lives. I mean, think of Peter in the moment when Jesus appears. Peter has not had a good couple days. He, he's in that room not feeling good about his performance the last few days. And it's a good thing that Jesus doesn't show up and say, get to work. It's a good thing that those aren't the first words out of Jesus' mouth because Peter doesn't have much faith in himself. Good. It's not about you, Peter. It's about what Jesus just accomplished on the cross. And you know what he did? He bought peace for you. Like, do you realize, like, you want to, who in here, don't, don't raise your hand, but who in here wants to live a life for Christ that counts? I assume most of you do. That you want your life to count. Where do you find the strength to pursue that? Where's Peter going to find the strength? Not in himself. He finds it in these words. Christ bought peace for you. The resurrection of Jesus means that what he did on Friday has cleared every charge against us in the courtroom of God. The resurrection of Jesus means that your guilt is washed away forever. I don't know what you come in this morning carrying. I had some thoughts this week of some parenting failures that just devastated my heart. Some stuff that, some stuff that I've done that just made me so heavy and so shameful. Because I just haven't loved my kids well at times. The resurrection of Jesus means every charge in the courtroom of God is cleared. It means that my future and your future, Christian, is secured with Christ as members of his family forever. Mary, go tell Peter, my brother, that I'm going to my father and his father. The resurrection of Jesus means that every sour, every painful, every disappointing, every unexpected twist of fate is ultimately going to be worked by God for your good. The resurrection of Jesus means that every malfunction in your body and in your mind and in your health, all your suffering will be resolved and replaced with an imperishable, everlasting physical inheritance for wonder and glory and joy and life. So... Don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. Don't live in turmoil. Don't live in doubt. Don't live in hopelessness as though this world and this body and this brokenness is your destiny. It's not your destiny. It wasn't Peter's destiny. It's not the destiny of any person who belongs to the resurrected Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of your future. The gospel announces, therefore, peace to you and to me. And it's meant to relieve us of that fear. It's meant to relieve us of that turmoil of heart. The resurrection of Jesus means peace for you. So, as we settle into these last three verses, that's the first thing I want you to hear. It's just the, just the gospel. It's just the message, not of what you have to do, but of what Christ has done. And the resurrection seals it for you. Peace be to you. Here's the second thing that Jesus does. He now gives them a mission. He preaches the gospel to them, and then he gives them a job to do. 
I said that I said that it's a good thing that the first thing that Jesus said wasn't get to work. It was the second thing he said to them. <laughs> the first thing he said to them is, I took care of all the garbage, and I cleansed you, and you're my family. Okay? Now, we got work to do. Uh, look at verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. And here he goes. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Mission. Mission. Assignment. The peace of God announced to us through the gospel that is secured for us by the resurrection of Jesus is followed by an assignment. The Father sent Jesus, and Jesus in a similar way is now sending us. The resurrection didn't conclude the mission of God. The resurrection brought the mission of God to its next phase. And we have a job to do in that next phase. Like Mary, like the disciples, when our fears are replaced with the joy that comes with the good news of the resurrection, we now have a very important job to do. And it's not just the job of vocational missionaries or pastors or ministry leaders. It's the job of every man, every woman, every child, every business leader, every employee, every student, every member of whatever realm of society, every neighbor, every customer who has the privilege of having their hearts awakened to the reality of Jesus. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then just as he was sent by the Father, so also you have been sent by the Son. You have a mission. Do you, do you realize that? Do I realize I have been given an assignment that's supposed to like direct my life. A mission to make God known. Just you see, the Father sent Jesus so that the Son would make the Father known. And now we have a job to do. So we tell the world about Jesus so that they might know the Father. We just continue on that same mission. To make God known through the gospel. we got a city full of people that do not know our God. And our task is actually pretty simple. As a Christ-like people, go live among them and then tell them about what he did. Tell the story and do it as people who look like him so that who we are and what we have to say kind of look like each other. <laughs> Be a Christ-like people and tell the story of Christ for the fame of Jesus and the joy of our city. It's a pretty simple task, pretty straightforward. He saves our lives, calls us to walk in his way, and tell people the story about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's what moves the mission forward in this phase of history. And then he does a third thing for us. We talked about he tells them the gospel. He's preaching it to us this morning. He gives us a mission this morning. And then the third thing he does is he tells us, and I'm going to give you power to do it. Check it out. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says this really weird thing in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. He said two things here. The first one is that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. And then the second thing is that he says that the community of the disciples now, as opposed to the Jews, the community of the disciples now hold the keys of the kingdom. That's what he's talking about in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness, it's withheld. Okay, you guys, you disciples, are the ones who now are speaking accurately and authoritatively regarding who's in and who's out. Because you are the ones who have the authoritative message regarding sin and forgiveness. It no longer belongs to the... Messiah rejecting house of Israel, it belongs to the people of God now 
in Christ. It belongs to the church. You guys, you of the Holy Spirit, you of the gospel are the ones who have the authoritative message that delineates between who's forgiven and who's not forgiven. It no longer belongs to the house of Israel. It belongs to the church. And with that message of the Savior who provides forgiveness of sins, the church has been granted the heavenly power of the Holy Spirit. The power for the mission to tell the world the story of Christ does not reside in us as though it were of us. The, the God of the universe must impart his own life into us by his spirit so that we are empowered. There is a heavenly power behind this proclamation so that it bears supernatural fruit. If we go out in our city and we proclaim the message of Jesus and we don't do it by the Holy Spirit, no fruit. No fruit. Which is why Jesus told the disciples, wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes and then testify. Wait for power. Pentecost is when it came. We are people who have received a message of salvation. We've been assigned a mission, and we've been, we've been given heavenly power for the sake of that mission. So what more could we ask for? What more could we possibly ask for than this great salvation which brings joy to our hearts, the privilege of being participants in the mission of God, and the power from heaven for that mission to succeed? What more could we ask for? We are the most privileged of all people. I want you to ask yourself, and I want to help you think through this, where, where does the gospel and these benefits that come along with the gospel, where does it intersect your life today? As the resurrected Jesus appears to us by his word, where is that hitting you today. Perhaps it's on this issue of the gospel. Maybe your heart isn't feeling the joy. Maybe you're, maybe you're not feeling the relief of sins forgiven. Like Peter's relief changed his life. Right? Maybe, maybe for you, it's just a, maybe this is your big takeaway. You just need to think upon the reality of what Christ has finished through his resurrection. Maybe you just need to feel the weight of peace be to you. Does that give you joy? Does that give you relief? I think probably some people are in here this morning carrying mountains of shame. Perhaps because they're hiding something. And I'm begging you, come clean. And receive some peace. Lay that burden down and receive some peace. And be washed. And be changed. Maybe that's your big takeaway for today. Think of Mary and Martha, right? Not Mary Magdalene, but Mary, the sister of Martha. That scene where Martha's busy getting after it. And what's Mary doing? She's, she's, just, she's just soaking in the teaching of the Lord. Maybe that's what she needs. Jesus always tells us what he's done before he tells us to get to work. Is it beautiful to you? Is what he's done beautiful to you? Maybe that's your big takeaway. Or maybe your big takeaway has more to do with the mission piece. Like, like maybe you don't understand the significance of being called to take part in the mission of God on the earth. Like maybe that just hasn't resonated with you yet. Maybe that doesn't feel like the greatest privilege you could possibly imagine when you consider like why you're still here on the earth. Because God has work that needs to be done, and he hasn't taken you yet because you get to be a part of it. Maybe that doesn't sound all that awesome to you. 
Maybe you don't even think about the fact that there is a mission. Perhaps you're just living life and you're making decisions not mainly guided by God's mission, but being guided by some other all-encompassing purpose that drives you to do whatever it is that you do. Like, I just spent a week in Mexico, and I come back, and you know there's like this thought in me that's like, hmm, can I live, can I find some way to live in Mexico? <laughs> like, could I rearrange my life somehow so that like, when I retire, is that what you're living for? Is that the mission that drives you? Is some little Mexican dream? Is that it? Jed and Grace moved their family across the country to be part of a church that had a vision to see churches planted. Because Jed and Grace are living for the mission of God. Jacques and Katie moved their family, closed their business, moved their family from New York to Fort Collins, Colorado to help start a church because they believe in the mission of God. Justin and Carrie moved their family from Joplin, Missouri to Fort Collins, Colorado because they're not living for some little dream. They're living for the mission of God. They'll live for it and they die for it. And they did die for it. They had to die for a, to a lot of comfort. A lot of everything their kids have ever known was in some other place. Some comfortable life that they've lived. Chad and, the, and Jen and the Squires uh, are, are about to start a church down in Loveland. That's crazy. How many people you got? Four? Six? <laughs> Plus kids. They count. You gotta count those. 30 kids. Got 30 kids. <laughs> Why? Because they believe in a mission that's bigger than the little dream. The little tiny American dream. Are you living? Are you aware? of the mission of God. And is that what you're living for? Maybe that's your big takeaway today. Or maybe your big takeaway today is that you are spinning your wheels because you are doing it all in your own power. And you need the Holy Spirit. Power. To which I would say, okay, Pray, pray, pray. I think that's, for me, I'm like, oh my gosh. Lord, give power to this work at Joy City Church. Give, power, give heavenly power. We've got to pray. i got to pray and plead with God. Will you infuse this with something supernatural that just catches fire in our hearts? in our city. We have a joy-producing message of salvation. We have a mission. And we have power. They're all ours in Christ. And they're all secure because of the resurrection. He is risen.